awareness of what goes into a good cup of coffee prepares the way for the specialty industry, which may be the harbinger of a just and sustainable future. I walked into a Starbucks about a year ago, a little kid behind the counter. Hi, sir. Yeah, yeah give me a regular. Regular what? Coffee. <laughs> what flavor? Coffee flavored. Grande non fat latte, one equal and whipped cream. Got a grande mocha Valencia. I have an iced grande caramel macchiato. You can get every other flavor except coffee flavored coffee. Oh, latte. They got mochaccino, they got chocaccino, frappuccino, cappuccino, rappuccino, alpuccino. What the f? At the Specialty Coffee Association's annual meeting, members reach out to bridge the divide between northern roasters and southern growers. The joy of the SCAA show is that you find people from all around the world. So here's a scene I've read about, the very best way of making coffee. Your individual vacuum press coffee. Oh, God. It's got the most pure fragrance. Can I buy this equipment? Oh, cash? <laughs> I remember talking to investors and they say, you want to charge two, three dollars for a cup of coffee with uh, Italian names that no one could pronounce at a time in America when coffee consumption is down. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You should get that espresso first with that hint of lemon. By Baristas are the bartenders of specialty coffee. At the World Barista Championships, they compete to concoct the latest gourmet coffee cocktail. And enjoy! Tomamos café. Y todo el mundo que toma una taza de café lo toma como por placer, pero no sabe que detrás de una taza de café hay mucha gente trabajando. Eh, detrás de una taza de café hay un problema social. Well, what you can see behind me is a train of traditional uh, donkeys, very much of the kind that in a country like Ethiopia would deliver coffee to market. And we are bringing those donkeys here to the stock exchange in London to deliver our message to some of the world's most powerful companies. We're saying to them it's time to ensure a decent price for the farmers who produce the coffee that we drink. Beauty. Reaction against big corporate coffee sparks the specialty coffee revolution. A revolution that tries to do the right thing, while at the same time drinking fully from the cup of life. It really began with people who just wanted good coffee. All they wanted was a decent cup of coffee instead of the swill they were being given. But it did lead most of them to realize that in order to get good coffee, you actually had to go down and see how it was being grown, and you had to give people a better life while you were doing it. You had to pay them to, to make better coffee. And this spawned a whole group of fanatical, devoted followers. The whole 60s was an opening up to the world. We frankly had nothing but contempt for what came before us. It was a complete, total rejection of the coffee industry. New Maxwell House Western Blend gives you honest coffee pot flavor every time. You tasted this infernal coffee, and once you had tasted the good stuff, it was like two different worlds. And many years later, in 68, the whole specialty scene is born with beets, and this was almost like a religion. Peets in Berkeley and Murchies in Vancouver roast quality beans in their small shops. When three hippies with gourmet taste try the coffee, they're inspired to set out on a quest for the perfect cup. We had bought peets by mail from the Bay Area, had uh, driven to uh, Vancouver uh, to buy coffee there. There were a few shops in New York. There was a little bit of the beginnings, or if you like, the end of the last specialty coffee business that provided the seeds for the next generation of specialty coffee. In 1971, Jerry Baldwin and his partners open a little coffee bean shop in Seattle's Pike's Place Market and name it after the coffee drinking first mate in Moby Dick, Starbucks. It was instantly successful, and I became the person who 
was the roaster and the coffee buyer uh, as we started to develop our own uh, independence from Alfred Pete. And it just got in my blood. Quality coffee is getting into a lot of people's blood, and the counterculture coffee house scene is about to be marketed to the world. Now since the brewing and the pressing of the caffeinated coffee bean, some pretty heavy hitters have been hitting at the coffee house scene, like Albert Einstein and Edward Lloyd, Ginsburg, Picasso, and Freud. It's just a partial cast of friends from past who held the cafe in high esteem. And a day the coffee house beats out of sight When the players get together for a hoot on a Monday night You may see them walking in Oh, they got those whiskers on their chin And talking that bohemian rag Even at Starbucks, all it revolution It's clearly evolution And talking that bohemian rag I joined Starbucks in 1982 when we were opening our fourth store, believe it or not. The epiphany for me, though, was when I was actually sent by Starbucks to Italy and became enamored with the Italian coffee bar. The romance of the Italians and how they brought coffee to life, the theatrical presentation, uh, the extension of people's homes. and I. I realized that despite the fact that Starbucks had done this wonderful job in educating people in Seattle about coffee, uh, in a way they had, they had missed what I thought was the most significant opportunity, and that was the romance of the beverage and creating a sense of community in the store. And since Starbucks only sold whole bean or ground coffee for the home, I raced back from Italy with this uh, uh, wonder in my eye about recreating the Italian coffee bar in my own image and bring it to America. Back in America, Howard Schultz buys out Starbucks and opens three cafes a week in his own image. Jerry Baldwin chooses to stick with roasting and acquires Pete's. While in Canada, an unlikely coffee mogul is swigging cheap wine and living on the streets. In the uh, early 70s, uh, I'd hit a very difficult point in my life. I had uh, an addiction to drugs and alcohol, and that had taken me to a place that was really quite alarming. I ended up on Skid Row in Toronto, Jarvis and Shooter Street, uh, panhandling on Young Street for nickels and dimes to get a bottle of wine, to get a place to stay, 50 cents a night, flop houses. If we wanted a blanket, we'd throw you another room 25 cents a house. And we didn't care about the blanket because we had a bottle of wine. Sure, a bottle That's of wine. We were, we were called wine over 10. Now we're called street people. Is that right? Yeah, well, I used to be a wino with you. Yeah. 99 cents for a bottle of wine. Remember that? It was a time in my life where I experienced things that no person really needs to experience. And however it happened, in late December 1971, there was a kind of a moment of truth, a moment where I saw myself perhaps as I hadn't before, and I realized I couldn't go any further. I couldn't do this anymore. I started a company called The Second Cup. Do you know it? Oh, I know their coffee cup. Yeah, I created it. Well, them. yeah? So that's why they're doing it. But you know, 70? 7 Eleven got better coffee than coffee time? Well, coffee time, yeah, but Second Cup is much better. I know it's better. Yeah, it costs more, though. Costs more, exactly. Good meeting you. I'm pleasure to meet you. Good luck. Adios. Thank you. God bless you all. In 1974, I met a guy named Tom Culligan, and he and I were determined to win in spite of all odds, and we decided to go into business for ourselves. I'll never forget our first time we ordered coffee. We looked in the yellow pages, where else would you look, and we found a supplier of coffee, and we phoned him, and we ordered this coffee. We had labels, we had that coffee. So he sent it along, and in those days, it used to come in brown paper sacks, lined, and they would stamp the outside of the uh, bag with Columbia, Mocha Java, Kenya, and we'd put the, each one in the appropriate bin. We hired a woman who came into the store, and she knew something about coffee, thank God, and she looked at all these beans, and she said, oh, they're the same bean. The guy just changed the stamp, you know. Had, <laughs> you want mocha? I have mocha stamp. <laughs> and one day we were commiserating, wondering what we were going to do about business, and we went into a Baskin Robbins store. What changed the second cup happened right there and then. When we came out of the store, Tom saw how I sampled the ice cream. Why don't we brew a little bit of coffee 
and sample the coffee. And then the final idea that really changed everything is we decided we would charge more money for our coffee than anybody else in the mall so people would know they had a good cup of coffee. Well, the lineup started at our kiosk and never went away. Daily draws, daily winners, and second cup is first on hand. Charging the highest price in the mall means selling a quality bean, which is what brings specialty roasters to La Minita, one of the finest coffee estates anywhere. Here, the second cup and Pete's are more than willing to pay a premium price. Today, Jerry Baldwin arrives with his staff from San Francisco. The trees that you see here are about one year old. To get the seed stock to start off the coffee trees here in the nursery, what we do is we go around the farm and look for trees that we know have yielded very, very good fruit during the harvest. We take some of that fruit, like this one, and we pop the seeds out just like we would do if we were milling the coffee for preparation and let it dry on the patio to the mm -hmm. parchment state. And that parchment coffee then gets placed into one of these plastic pots, which is filled with a mixture of fertilizer and soil from the farm. It takes two or three years before they start to produce any fruit, and really five years until we're into full production. For most people, uh, the ideal cup of coffee, or the perfect cup of coffee, is produced of washed Arabica coffee. So, perfect conversation for being in Costa Rica, because it's one of the world's best producers of washed Arabica coffee. Costa Rica specializes in Arabica beans, and consumers seem eager to learn what makes them so different from the lowly Robustas. The coffee tour at Cafe Brit is the country's third largest tourist attraction. Here in Costa Rica, by law, we only plant Arabica. It has the sweetest taste, better quality bean, less caffeine also. Mm -hmm. It's better paid in the market. So. Uh, that's important. The best oh. Arabica grows up in the mountains. At that altitude, the coffee beans are very hard yes. and heavy. And if the beans are hard, they can receive the temperatures in the roaster oven. The low-grown coffee is porous, it's fragile, it will break and it will burn in the oven, and that gives coffee a bitter taste. You're picking a fruit that's full of sugar, which is, we, uh, we know, starts fermentation. So this has to be treated quickly and carefully to remove the sugar, dry the coffee, and capture the flavor that's in the bean. Would you like to taste it? Can I throw it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I know. No, it's no, there's a, no, no, no. I can't. It's a laxative. Yeah. All of the flavor potential exists at the moment of picking. Each step after that provides the opportunity to maintain that flavor or impair it in some way or other. Bueno, ahora lo que estamos en este momento es en la recolección de café. Que queden bien cogidas, bien juntado y no se damos un tiquete para que vayan al corte. Solo coger la calidad, porque eso es lo que quieren ellos, solo el rojo, el rojo. Nada de verde ni nada de pintón, solo la calidad, solo el rojo, el rojo. La cajuela está a 400, ¿verdad? Y hay personas muy rápidas, hay personas que cogen 6, 7 cajuelas, 8 cajuelas. Hay personas que se ganan 5 mil, 6 mil colones. Eso depende de cómo sea la persona, el peón. Costa Rica has a few large plantations and many small farms which traditionally grow quality coffee. But the farmer's share of what consumers pay is far too little to ensure their survival. I was born in a coffee family. So I grow up with the coffee plants instead of a backyard, but I love it. Here in Costa Rica, we have production costs that are close to 90 cents per pound. And the international price is six, 
sexy. So we can't afford that. So we had to find out better ways to sell our coffee. And uh, there's programs like Fair Trade that really help the people that is growing coffee in this country and other countries around the world. The idea is to eliminate the middleman, the man who is uh, getting richer because of the bad prices. Give a premium to those farmers who have those difficult conditions to produce coffee to improve their lives. Hi, have you heard about the Berkeley Coffee Initiative? The Berkeley what? Coffee Initiative? It's in favor of Measure O. Anybody a Berkeley voter? Do you vote? No. Coffee? Yeah. yeah. Have you heard? Oh, would you like to? Oh. Any business in the city of Berkeley that sells coffee has to buy coffee from fair trade growers? It's, it means that all brewed coffee sold within the city has to be organic or fair trade or shade grown. So 60s Berkeley was the home of social protest and specialty coffee. Today, a new issue has hit Telegraph Avenue. Instead of free love, it's fair trade. And consumers are being asked to consider how their coffee is grown. Not too much, but... But then aren't you forcing people to do something that they may not want to do, even though it's the right thing to do? I mean, it's... Isn't that the way we do things in society? We don't ask people to drive the speed limit. We don't ask companies to pay minimum wage. We tell them to. We don't ask companies, hey, could you follow these environmental guidelines? We say, these are the laws. This is what you need to do. But I, I wonder if everybody knows... Um, why they're doing that. Fair Trade Certified is the symbol seen more and more in shops and cafes around the world. It assures the future of the half million small farm growers in the fair trade movement. This is why groups like Global Exchange are advocating for fair trade in coffee. Imagine if your only source of income was once a year and you had no idea month to month what that was going to be, if it was going to be $300 a year or if it was going to be $500 for the year, for your total yearly income to feed all of your family, put your kids to school, put food on the table, pay for your housing. So what normally happens is that sometime in the fall, a local person referred to as a coyote will come to these farmers and say, hey, I see that your kids don't have any shoes or that your daughter's sick. I tell you what. I will pay you money up front for your harvest now to take care of your immediate needs if you promise me your harvest when it comes in in the future. And they get locked into the cycle of poverty and crushing debt because of this. Many of these farmers got together and formed cooperatives and by working together gained more power vis-a-vis -vis the market. Then throughout the years they contacted different organizations in Europe, in the United States, in, in um, Japan, in different countries and set up fair trade systems. And what fair trade is then is an international system for assuring that farmers get paid a fair price for their work. Few places depend more on fair prices for coffee than Latin America. It is such an important crop that schools break for the coffee harvest. Some children get time off to work beside their families. But the children of migratory workers don't go to school at all. They have to work the year round. There's no experience like traveling to source. After meeting the people that grow the coffee that I was selling every day, I couldn't just look at it anymore as, as a bean or as a beverage. It became a symbol for the relationships that I'd developed with people, for their sense of community and for their families and their hopes and dreams for the future. One of my missions has become to educate people about coffee and about the people that produce coffee. So it's a great conversation piece when you're making somebody's latte to say, so by the way, do you know that this latte is a fair trade latte? And do you know what that means? And I was in Nicaragua last summer and I met the man who grows this coffee that you're drinking. 
That's a really cool thing to be able to say to someone. The perfect latte starts with the perfect espresso shot. Now we begin the espresso extraction. I'm grabbing a chilled container for my steamed milk because the chilled container helps me make better foam and some cold whole milk. I love producing the awesome latte that the person comes back and says, that's the best latte I've ever had. You're listening for when the bubbles are coming out like tight, foamy, frothy bubbles. And I can also hear when the milk is hot enough because it gets to a deeper pitch. It's like hearing the right musical note. You've left maybe half an inch in the top for your espresso shot, which is by now done extracting. And you pour it very slowly into the foam and you'll see that it stays just above the layer of milk. So you get this beautiful sunset effect. And then you can even add a little chocolate sprinkles if you like. It's perfect. While many might agree on what makes a perfect latte, not everyone agrees that fair trade is the only way to share the wealth. There are a number of alternatives in the specialty industry, including the one being pursued at La Minita. In the 80s, it was becoming apparent that the coffee market was going to collapse. At the same time, I had recognized this, this new quality awareness in North America where people really were becoming concerned about the quality of the product. So I tried to think of a way to take the coffee and disassociate it from the world price and came up with La Manita. We took it to the small roasters in North America and delivered the coffee ourselves. A lot of those very first people that we sold to are still clients. Second Cup were very determined to sell a really good cup of coffee and we made an arrangement to sell them an exclusive of La Manita in Canada. I don't think anyone had ever gone directly to the specialty industry and said, here's a coffee that we grew, it's a fixed price. But the premium is based on getting something of value. Specialty coffee itself is innately supportive of people producing coffee because that premium flows all the way down the chain. You're not going to get anyone to produce great coffee unless they're rewarded for it. If he's not worried about his housing, the health care of his family, he's going to do a good job with the coffee. We pay everyone more money in order to do it right. And that reward is innately ennobling. I have a problem with a lot of the fair traders. I believe that it's essentially cultural imperialism. It's all unsustainable. If the charitable side of it dries up, poof, it's all gone. There is virtually no concern with quality which is the one thing where you can actually add value to a product so that you can sell it for a fair price. We don't sell fair trade coffee, we sell fairly traded coffee. Yeah, eso dentro de la finca, todo para hacer la casa, lo ganamos la plata aquí dentro de la finca. Después de ahí compramos un ticito por allá donde vivimos, hicimos la casa y lo pusimos para allá. Tengo novia, vive por allá abajo, muy largo, ¿eh? y me gustaría casarme y seguir trabajando dentro de la minita, hacer una casita para vivir. Seguir trabajando dentro de la minita, porque aquí es donde lo superamos nosotros. Bill McAlpin rules his paradise like an enlightened monarch with an obsessive attention to quality. But his approach doesn't necessarily work for smaller growers without his vision and international business connections.
many people in the specialty industry are familiar with the plight of producers and have actually seen the devastating effects on quality of the coffee crisis. And so they want to make sure that in 10 years from now there will be a specialty industry. They are paying a lot more uh, real attention to doing what they need to do to make sure that their industry is sustainable and really leading the way for the rest of the coffee industry so that the cans, as we refer to the Folgers and Maxwell House and those folks, um, are really put on the defensive. We are horrid. It was cheap. I'm not surprised. It came in a huge. How huge? It'll last a long time. Last a long time? How long? Well, Six I, I think it's very yeah. nice. Now look. About two-thirds of the entire coffee industry is dominated by just a few players. Uh, Folgers, for example, is owned by Procter & Gamble, and they do over 600 million pounds of coffee a year. You know the Folgers looks richer. Maxwell House is the second biggest label, and they're owned by Philip Morris, the global cigarette company. Uh, and then we also have Sara Lee. Be back in a second with coffee. There's Nestle, obviously, which is a huge company around the world uh, in terms of their coffee holdings. After that is Starbucks. And they are over a $2 billion company. And with their expanse worldwide, they are really the global leader in the specialty coffee industry. And they actually make more money per than just about any coffee company in the world. The major labels buy nearly half the world's beans every year, while Starbucks buys less than 2%. But as the leading specialty company, Starbucks occupies a unique place in the market as it tries to live up to its claim that coffee is more than just a commodity. We feel very, very strongly that uh, we have a responsibility as the leader in this industry to lead and to define for the marketplace that the, the cost of doing business in this industry uh, is to give back and to make an investment in the sustainability of this marketplace. When protesters in Seattle trash a Starbucks cafe at the World Trade Organization Summit, the company has to defend its image as an enlightened multinational corporation. We are not going to let something like this dissuade us from maintaining dialogue and cooperation with organizations that care about these issues, because we care about them too. It's ironic that Starbucks sometimes is the target for ill will or concerns uh, because we're, we're such a visible and ubiquitous company. But the truth of the matter is that we are doing such a, a good job to build sustainability and make sure that the people on the ground doing the work are rewarded for their efforts in ways that are not happening through traditional methods. Unfortunately, the, the road is paved with so many companies, many of whom are much, much larger than Starbucks, who are doing very little and sometimes nothing at all. Starbucks um, likes to compare itself to the big three companies when it comes down to sustainability because obviously um, as a company they are far and away better than Folgers and Maxwell House. Um, I think that that's really not where the competition is for them though. They are competing with all of the other specialty coffee importers. So their leadership really needs to come in terms of the specialty industry. And what we've seen is that they're a follower and not a leader. When the World Trade Organization met in the fall of 1999 in Seattle, the home of Starbucks, Starbucks was a perfect target. At that time, they were not selling any fair trade coffee. They were the world's largest supporter of care, and they were doing all kinds of good, but they were perceived as being the sort of big guy, the McDonald's of coffee. So I can understand why activists have done what they've done, and they have moved Starbucks along faster than they would have gone. Now Starbucks is selling about 1.6% of fair trade coffee. They've been criticized for not selling enough of it, but that's still a huge amount. They're also selling organic coffee, shade-grown coffee that is bird-friendly, and about 15% of their coffee support the growers who will abide by their certification <laughs> standards, which are quite high. One day in Colombia, South America, 
Juan Valdez took his son Ramon to show him how he grows coffee. See the Today in the highlands of Colombia, small growers like Juan Valdez face being forced off their land or having to support their families by growing drugs, the cash crop that never goes bust. Then came the path Ramon liked best. Juan hoisted him on his mule. Specialty roasters understand the role they play in supporting farmers like Juan Valdez and their families. When I spoke before Congress, I quoted a Wall Street Journal article, 125 million people's lives are being affected by the low prices of coffee. The load on each farmer's shoulders is getting heavier every single day. When I was in Colombia, I talked to the Hinoteca mayor and I said, well, why don't you grow something else? And the mayor said to me, you need a quick cash crop to survive. They gotta feed their kids tomorrow, not in five years. They can't say, don't eat for five years and then I'll put a meal on your table. So these farmers did a desperate move and they started planting coca plants. And then the drug lords started stealing their sons and forcing them to join the paramilitary groups. These 55, 60 year old farmers had tears in their eyes as they talked to me. They told me that they organized a cooperative. It wasn't easy. The drug lords killed some of the farmers that formed the cooperative. But they fought and eventually people started buying the fair trade coffee. They were able to fight off the drug lords. They were able to make a living off of a quality cup of coffee. As specialty roasters find better ways to support their sources, many are looking to them as a new economic model for a more equitable relationship. Coffee is a path along which 500 million people in the world are journeying. And to bring awareness to that path is my personal mission in life. Here is a way, specialty coffee or very high quality coffee, here is a way to change the face of this industry. Not only in the cup around the world, but at the farm level, these are some of the poorest countries in the world. And to find that bridge and build that bridge so that people could really understand that if coffee is grown in a certain way and the necessary care is given to it, it will support you. Most of the farmers I met hadn't ever tasted their coffee. They had no idea what it tasted like. And they had no idea how it compared to their neighbor or the guy down the road, or certainly had no idea in Guatemala what a Costa Rican tasted like, or a Sumatra or an Ethiopian. I mean, the world of coffee was their own little tiny farm. As I learned their microcosm, I, I tried to share with them the macrocosm, of all the places that I'd been and the different techniques of people around the world that were doing the same thing that they were doing. Like many small farmers around the globe, Alfredo Rance provides a healthy environment for both the workers and migratory birds on his finca. But until specialty buyers came along, Alfredo wasn't aware that his organic bird-friendly coffee could fetch a premium price. Three years I've been certified organic. Perfect. Sí. ¿Y las especies de árboles? Bueno, hay variedades aquí, uh -huh. tal como este. Ah. Porco. Porco, la semilla es para el animales. Uh -huh. Y también las aves. Para lo las aves. Sí, los dos, el tipo de ave y ah, animalitos también. Bien, lo comen. Sí. Bien, excelente. With his farm now certified, Alfredo makes three times more than he used to for the same beans. El café no estuviera como está, como ustedes lo ven. Uh -huh. No, las, el, la hoja del café nos hace follaje, Ajá. nos produce abono. Ah, nos produce ya, abono. Ya, sí, correcto, sí, correcto. Como usted puede observar, don Francisco, al producir esto, la mata se alimenta de esto. Correcto. 
y nos produce el fruto muy, muy completo. Fertilizante natural. Perfecto. Nosotros los agricultores en café orgánico ha sido primeramente que nos han enseñado a trabajar con la tierra sin echarle ninguno a químico. químico. Más luego, la salud de nosotros ha mejorado constantemente porque no produce ninguna intoxicación. Correcto. Sí. Al no aplicar químicos. Al no aplicar químicos. Y más luego, pues estamos disfrutando también de, de, de un precio que la empresa nos, nos favorece mucho. The coffee plant was born in the uh, understory of the African rainforest, so it's a shade tolerant plant. It's like a house plant. It likes to be in the shade. In the 1970s, agronomists learned that you could cut the forest off of a coffee farm and expose the plant to the full sun, bathe them in agrochemicals, and double or triple the production. This is a, a full sun farm, and this is not the kind of farm that the Rainforest Alliance would normally certify. But there's an important thing happening here. This farm, Finca Aquiares, is reforesting. You can see a few trees coming in already. They're planting thousands of trees every year. It might take 20 years before this is a forested farm. We want to show that coffee can go back towards sustainability. There are millions of bags more coffee than we consumers are willing to drink. And what the world wants is more quality coffee. The farmers can grow less coffee, get a higher price for it. Consumers are happy. Wildlife is happy. Workers are happy. So it's one of those rare win-win situations. For a person who wants to buy coffee that will do good for the world, there are a number of options. Certainly fair trade is an obvious one, and it's a good one. Rainforest Alliance also has a certification which does good for the environment and for the people who are growing the coffee. If you buy specialty coffee in general, you're probably supporting decent practices in the coffee places where it came from. But it's a very small part of the world market. Consumers of the 21st century are by and large far more aware of the fact that when they buy something at a supermarket, they're having an effect in the world. They're making a statement by what they buy. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the time they still say, well, what's cheaper? I'm going to buy the cheapest thing. While growers are trying to survive, the big bucks are being made only after the beans are unloaded in the north. This is most true of Starbucks, which is trying to accomplish what many consider the impossible, to straddle the divide between long-term sustainability and the short-term profits needed to build a global brand. Today there are way over 6,000 stores we are now the most frequented retailer in the world where the average customer is coming in 18 times a month. And in terms of the growth and development, we will open between three and four new stores every day in 60 countries. The company that popularized Caramel Macchiato is today in the early stages of its global conquest. And wherever it raises its flag, Starbucks gives locals a taste of America which is what goes into every cup. Trainees arrive in Seattle from afar, including young Turks who come from the country that introduced coffee to the West. Now they are being indoctrinated in the Starbucks way. Can someone tell me what a perfect shot is? It comes in 10 seconds. Any comments Ten. to that? Yeah, 18, 18, 18 seconds. Yeah, wow. I feel like I'm drinking Turkish coffee. That coffee, as we call kahve, uh, they're 
very old, still in Istanbul, in the big metropolitan city, Istanbul, you can find in the like in the back streets. Usually the mangoes, they drink Turkish coffee. But Starbucks atmosphere will be different than those cafes because everybody can come to our Starbucks. At Starbucks, the coffee house is no longer an exclusive male domain. Women have a place here too. For every franchise, no matter how far flung, is an outpost of the contemporary world. Yes, we will gonna use some English Starbucks language. Tall, grand and frappuccinos. In the beginning, it will be difficult for our customers, but we're gonna teach them how you order the coffee, you know, how you can enjoy our coffee. <laughs> it has been an unbelievable turn of events over the last six or seven years to watch the response that people all over the world have had to Starbucks. And that experience is not American. That experience has a universal language and universal appeal, and that has been the big breakthrough for us. Starbucks is about making universal a standardized coffeehouse culture, which is at best its appeal, and at worst, the threat it poses to other cultures in its path. A lot of people don't like Starbucks because it's exactly the same experience wherever you go. You can count on Starbucks being clean, you can have bright baristas giving, asking if you want a grande a size, etc. And frankly, I think that's justified criticism in many cases. I mean, if you don't want exactly the same Starbucks experience, go somewhere else. The good news is that usually there is an alternative. One alternative to corporate sameness is Delocator.net, the California-based website created by Xteam to sustain independent cafes and local culture. Simply type in your zip code and find every alternative cafe within a few miles of your door. Go ahead, we can hear you. Corporations like Starbucks um, that are international and that have a lot of power and money have a, a much larger advantage in marketing and, um, and taking up our, our space in culture and um, as a result end up dominating largely how our culture perceives reality. So the, the philosophy is that um, there are ways to, to combat that. There are ways to provide alternatives to that kind of... Um, and there are ways with the internet to gather as a community, let, you know, let other voices... That the, the target for you know, anyone who's looking for alternatives. Starbucks has bought out some very good chains, and they will continue to do that. They are the big bully on the specialty block. There's no question about that. Uh, they're very good at what they do, and they're going to keep doing it. <laughs> You have two of the greatest noses in the entire country right here. These are people that we How consider... What is your nose insured for, John? Uh, his nose is featured on my Pete's frequent drinker card. I mean, it's, it's so important that this is what you see, Jim's nose. Mm -hmm. George is looking for individual traits that he thinks could indicate a great single coffee. That's his passion. Whereas Jim, his blends are a legend. He's like a, a symphonic conductor. In a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor poorer, there will always be a future in catering to the refined tastes of the true connoisseur. For those seeking the perfect cup today, there is no contest as to which is the finest coffee. It's Ethiopia's Yerga Chefi. This is a very subjective thing. So one person's favorite doesn't mean it's the best, even if it's George. So, but the thing is that we all did, 
you know, as a consensus, we did agree that number one had the qualities that made an excellent cup of coffee, and like that perfect peach. That it's very round. Explodes, well, round. exactly. Yeah. It's just got that roundness, but all the acidity is there too, but it's perfectly cradled by, by everything else and the flavors in it. And to me, that's worth anything you can pay for. Wow, I think we're in danger of a real bifurcation in the market again. Because all these people are still purveying really good quality. And I think many more people are aware of it now. But the baseline of quality that is found in supermarket cans might well get lower. I, I agree with Corey. We're going back towards the commodification of coffee. You've got three years now of prices that are so low that the majority of farmers, even in good locations producing good quality, are getting way below the cost of production. The availability of quality coffees is going to diminish. I don't think that we have to worry because there is now a coffee consumer developing an understanding about the second largest traded commodity in the world after oil. You know, nobody says, well, my oil smells good, or my gas has this wonderful essence or aroma. We are dealing with a product that we are trying to lighten, to provide a crossover, a heritage to the tradition of wine. That's last year's 4.97. The debate here is not about quality of coffee but about whether our growing appreciation is sufficient to conserve the supply of quality beans. Will there be enough people who regard coffee as a fine wine or the ingredient of a gourmet meal? Je pense qu'il y a des points communs entre le vin et le café. Euh, souvent on dit que le café est un excitant, mais le vin est un excitant aussi. Un jour, euh, on a même osé euh, faire une crème de coquille Saint-Jacques, une charlotte de crabe comme ici, etc. On s'est aperçu qu'en associant le, un café chaud, on est arrivé à des accords tout à fait étonnants. L'idée n'était pas de dire on va éliminer le vin, on va servir que du café. Non, pas du tout. C'était surtout d'annoblir le café et vraiment de lui redonner une place, non pas à la fin du repas, mais dans le repas et sur la table. C'est ça, c'était l'objectif. À l'origine, le café s'appelle le vin d'Arabie. Le vin d'Arabie se déguise dans un verre. Les Arabes boivent le café dans un verre. Donc, sans s'en apercevoir, on n'avait pas inventé quelque chose, mais on était en train de lui donner une dimension différente. Monsieur Café, vous êtes à votre place, à l'honneur sur la table. Coffee lovers alone cannot bear the burden of bringing about a just relationship between producer and consumer. Activists worldwide are appealing to big government and the big four to follow the sustainable path taken by the specialty revolution. When people open their morning newspaper tomorrow, hopefully then they're drinking their morning coffee, they'll have a bit of a think about it. This is about the whole world coffee market not working. And so we're really looking for them to support the Oxfam campaign to, to take Nestle and Kraft and we can get um, the powerful government to actually take action to, to alleviate some of the suffering. Excuse me, you've got that fuel. One of the recent campaigns we've been working on is to pressure the leading U.S. Uh, retailers of coffee to adopt fair trade standards. It's going to be a much harder campaign. Um, they're not nearly as susceptible to consumer pressure as Starbucks was. And they buy the worst quality coffee in the market. Unfortunately, consumers are contributing to the problem because we don't know about the situation. And so we keep buying coffee from these terrible coffee companies. Nobody gets up in the morning and says to themselves, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and I want to make sure that I'm exploiting farmers and polluting the environment. Nobody says that. Yet unwittingly, we are contributing towards massive environmental devastation and exploitation in terms of taking food off the table of farmers when we buy coffee that's not sustainable. And it's really our choice. As this ancient being finally reaches the northern consumers who can delight in the pleasure of their coffee, the hope is that the quality of the bean, the quality of the environment in which it grows, 
and the quality of life of the farmer who grows it may all just come together in the perfect cup. Going to Ethiopia, we started out across the savannah. And there were lots of people walking. There was hut after hut, round huts. I noticed that there weren't pit toilets. There weren't wells. I had little girls come up to me and hold my hand. And they pulled me into the hut of their mother. And when I looked at that woman, I knew the love she had for her girl, her daughter. I knew she wanted for her daughter what I wanted for the daughter you met. She brewed coffee out of very dirty water that she had hauled up from a stream four hours away. She boiled it over a little stove in a coffee pot. It had coffee that she pestle and murdered. What she was serving me in that cup was the world's finest coffee. She was serving me Yerga Chefe. Yerga Chefi, in the birthplace of coffee, is one of the finest coffee-growing regions in the world. Here, farmers have started the first Ethiopian fair trade cooperative. They hope that by forming this cooperative, they can provide the basic needs for their families keep their culture and their community together and realize the dream of a better future for their children.